microphones as it causes feedback and could cause potential injury to our interpreters. That being said, the floor is open. Mr. Barrett, go ahead, please. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Chair, and uh, good morning to you and colleagues. I hope that everyone had a um, restful time with family and was able to uh, catch up with um, and connect with their um, their communities. Um, it was a challenging Christmas for many Canadians, and uh, we saw record food bank use and, of course, um, people facing challenges with their, their home heating bills. Um, I... Uh, I just want to quickly go over uh, a couple headlines and then I have a, a motion that I'd like to put forward um, to the committee chair. Um, some of the headlines that we saw over this Christmas were high prices, tight budgets, have Canadians trimming how they'll celebrate this Christmas. Montreal Soup Kitchen may have to stop feeding homeless for the first time since 1877. All I'm doing is working and paying bills. Why some are leaving Canada for more affordable countries and the rising cost of living means this mom of three goes hungry so her kids can eat. So it um, it has been a challenging time uh, for many people, and, and it's, of course, heartbreaking to, to see uh, the struggles that, that um, our fellow Canadians are uh, going through. Um, two more headlines. Trudeau's office won't answer questions on $84,000 vacation. Trudeau given free stay at $9,300 a night luxury Jamaican villa over Christmas holidays. And this is, of course, what brings us here. And those, those numbers are, of course, staggering. Uh, when we have um, an $84,000 vacation, when the median Canadian household income is about $70,000. And the, the problem uh, begins with the first answer uh, or, or first explanation that the Prime Minister's office uh, gave about this vacation. And this isn't a question about a prime minister being deserving of a vacation or anyone being deserving of a vacation if they're able to, um, if they're able to, to afford it and uh, they've got the time and uh, their health. Um, that's, that's wonderful that they're able to do that. The problem is, is that the first answer that the prime minister's office gave to Canadians about this was that the prime minister was paying for the vacation. And it wasn't until uh, media followed up and uh, learned about the cost of the destination and asked who was paying for it. And the answer was that, in fact, the Prime Minister was not paying for, for this, um, this vacation. So we started with the Prime Minister saying he was paying for it and then, um, and then saying that uh, it, was, it was being gifted to him. That's a remarkable uh, gift, um, $84,000. And... Um, the question of whether or not a prime minister should be accepting gifts worth $84,000 is one that perhaps an eventual study at this committee could, could consider, um, if it's ever appropriate. But the story changed again, and the prime minister offered a, a third version of events, uh, saying that he was staying with friends at their place and that um, he wasn't paying for it. So we know that his office said the Prime Minister's office said that the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner cleared the vacation. The uh, Ethics Commissioner has said since said that um, that's not a function that they provide. They don't pre-clear vacations. And the Ethics Commissioner uh, cannot release the correspondence between the Prime Minister and his office um, without, uh, without the authority to do that. Um, or an instruction to do that, a production order to do that. Uh, and uh, that can be resolved, of course, by the Prime Minister um, just furnishing, uh, you know, a, a Parliament, uh, Canadians, with that correspondence, releasing it, demonstrating that, um, that the third story that we got from the Prime Minister was, in fact, uh, the same story that he gave the Ethics Commissioner. The question is, was the Ethics Commissioner deceived or misled in any way? And so... Uh, we need to get to the bottom of that. Uh, the best way to do that would be to have the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner uh, come to this committee. I think that um, we, we could look at a number of things, uh, but the precision uh, the, of what we, what, we need to, what we need to accomplish, the reason that we are here is to deal with uh, this specific event, this $84,000 gift 
Um, it happened to take the the form of a vacation, and uh, and so that uh, that's why I have the following motion to move. I have it in both official languages. Uh, the clerk should um, should have received a copy of it, and very simply, chair that the interim conflict of interest and ethics commissioner appear at the earliest opportunity regarding the prime minister's vacation to Jamaica. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Barrett. Uh, the motion has been moved. Uh, the clerk has advised me that she has sent it to the members of the committee in both official languages. Um, and I suspect, Mr. Baird, just for clarity, that that's for one meeting, correct? Just, just yes. for one yep. meeting, okay. Good. Uh, the motion has been moved. Uh, I've got Mr. Brock followed by Ms. Khalid and then Ms. Damoff after that. Go ahead, Mr. Brock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, start at the outset by wishing all my colleagues a happy new year. I hope that uh, everyone had an enjoyable, relaxing uh, time away from the hill. A few of us, unfortunately, are back earlier than we anticipated, but uh, this is this is an important issue, not only for parliamentarians, but it's an important issue for Canadians. Uh, as my colleague, Mr. Barrett, has indicated, um, 2024 has not started off on a new footing. It's essentially the same sort of uh, uh, issues that uh, Canadians are dealing with uh, in 2023 and 2022, and that's the issue of affordability. I know uh, personally uh, many members of my constituency who uh, wrote to me and express their astonishment that uh, how tone deaf this prime minister and this liberal government was in, in light of all of the issues that Canadians are facing, that he would find it appropriate to accept an $84,000 gift for an extremely extravagant holiday in Jamaica. I think we are all of the same belief, and I believe all Canadians are of the same belief, Mr. Chair, that the Prime Minister is indeed worthy of a vacation. He is indeed worthy of spending quality time with his family. Uh, he was born of privilege. He maintains a lifestyle of privilege. It's now no shock to anyone here at this committee or in this house or across Canada that he is well connected with terms of friends and other associates around the world and uh, he probably enjoys staying at uh, locations that offer some of the finer things in life. We don't, we don't uh, begrudge that uh, as a starting point. What we do begrudge is how a particular issue such as this has blown up to such an extent that it now has the makings of a scandal. This was a really non-issue from the get-go. If the Prime Minister and his office were completely transparent as to who sourced this particular vacation, how it was communicated to the Prime Minister, all the terms associated with he accepting uh, the offer to stay at this luxurious villa, had he been upfront with Parliament, had he been upfront with Canadians, right from the outset, I don't think we'd be here today. But the Prime Minister and his office have compounded this particular issue as such that we as parliamentarians are here asking for clarification. And you know, Mr. Chair, this isn't a one-off. This is a pattern, a pattern of conduct uh, with this Prime Minister and his office to mislead Canadians. Setting aside the controversy surrounding his trip to the Aga Khan uh, Island and how he was found guilty of, of breaching the uh, ethic uh, guidelines, he promised Canadians in the House that he would do better, that he would communicate in advance with the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner and be upfront, because the hallmark of the Trudeau brand, the hallmark of the Trudeau government, is transparency. That's what he promised Canadians during the 2015 general election. You vote for me, you will have the most open, transparent, and accountable government this country has ever seen. Has that happened, Mr. Chair? Absolutely not. 
I really don't know if anyone on the liberal bench, and certainly the prime minister, even understand the definition of transparency. But most recently, the government has shuffled some positions. One of the shuffling of positions was the House leader, the government House leader, who is now occupying that position by the name of Steve McKinnon. Steve McKinnon was asked by the press with respect to this vacation. He indicated as follows. The Prime Minister, and this is a quote, the Prime Minister followed all the rules and in fact got his travel plans pre-approved by the Commissioner. We know that's a lie. It's misleading. It was deliberate. It was intentional on Mr. McKinnon's part to mislead Canadians. Because now we know that that office, the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner, does not pre-approve and give permission to vacation. The issue is whether or not the form of a gift qualifies as an acceptable one under the Act. To clarify, he says, the office... No, I'm sorry, that's the quote from the Ethics Commissioner. But he, he went on in, in a different interview. This is Steve McKinnon, the government house leader. And it said as follows. I think Canadians don't want to deny the Prime Minister the ability to take a Christmas vacation with his family. And that's what he did. McKinnon told reporters last week, all of the rules have been followed. And the law has, as one of its fundamental pillars, transparency which is, of course, the reason why we're discussing this today. The Prime Minister has acted transparently. Are we to accept the House Leader's word for that? I think that would be negligent. I don't think we'd be doing our job as His Majesty's loyal opposition to accept that at face value in light of the fact that the office has, has since rebutted the position taken by the Prime Minister and his office that this was pre-approved. There's a lot of smoke here, Mr. Chair, and I'm sure there is a fire that's burning, Mr. Chair, that we need to find out its source. As I indicated, this is not a one-off. It is a series of missteps by this government. I talked about the Aga Khan vacation. We then had the, um, the, the dress-up clown show in India. We then had the issue surrounding the very first Truth and Reconciliation Day. Again, one of the hallmarks of the Trudeau brand and our Prime Minister in the 2015 election was his pronouncement that no, there was no other relationship that was more important to Canada than its relationship with Indigenous Canadians. He created the very first Truth and Reconciliation Day after the discovery of the unmarked graves in Kamloops. This was an important milestone in the history of this country in an effort to broker reconciliation between non-Indigenous and Indigenous alike. What did the Prime Minister do? The Prime Minister instructed his office to lie to Canadians to say that he was in Canada engaging in private meetings when in fact some sleuths in the Canadian public were able to track his flight and realize he wasn't in Ottawa. He was en route to BC to take a surfing vacation. Point of, on point a of day. order, Chair. Point of order, Chair. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Damoff, on your point of order. And as it relates to the standing orders, I'd like to uh, just some clarification on that, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, the, twice now the member has said that the Prime Minister lied, and I think we all know that that is not allowed under parliamentary rules. So I just wondered if you could remind him that he he can't say that the Prime Minister lied. Um, if, if that could just, you could remind the Honourable Member of that, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Damoff. I'm going to ask Mr. Brock just to be a little more judicious in his, uh, his words. Thank the Prime you. Minister was deceitful to Canadians, uh, Mr. Chair. So... Instead of telling the truth that he, in fact, was in Ottawa, engaged in private meetings, he furthered his own selfish private interests in taking a surfing vacation on the very first day that he created. 
It was embarrassing and it was shameful and it was an event that should not have happened. So again, these are things that I wanted to bring to the attention of this committee that this now, this Jamaican Christmas vacation is not a one-off. It, it displays a pattern of miscommunication and deceit by the Prime Minister's office, giving three different versions of the truth as to what they communicated to the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner and we as parliamentarians, but more importantly, Canadians from coast to coast to coast, need some daylight shed on this issue. And for all of those reasons, I support my colleague's motion. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Brock. On the motion, I do have a list. I have Ms. Khalid, uh, followed by Ms. Damoff, uh, suivi par uh, Monsieur Gord, et Madame Fortier après Monsieur Gord. Uh, Ms. Khalid, go ahead, you have the floor. On the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think uh, on the motion, I think it's important for us to understand uh, the context of it. So if it's okay with you and through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask Mr. Barrett, I know that he had written to um, the, the Conflict of Interest uh, Commissioner. Uh, he had written a letter. I'm just wondering uh, if he had gotten a response and, and what that response was. Uh, and if that's okay, once I get the, the, the answer from Mr. Barrett, I'd like to take the floor back. Uh, Mr. Barrett, do you have a response for Ms. Khalid or not? The, um, I'd say that the most uh, um, uh, relevant point from the, the commissioner's response uh, was that, um, that he's not able to share uh, correspondence, if there was any, between um, the prime minister's office and his office. And so, um, you know, uh, hearing from the ethics commissioner and then being able to make a, uh, um, you know, make a decision as a committee on if we were going to, uh, have documents produced, um, the committee deciding if we were going to, uh, have a review of, uh, of the act. Um, these are all things that, uh, that we can do, but it's not something that the commissioner can do, uh, proactively. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Khalid, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm quite perplexed, actually. I mean, you know, on the on the one hand, we give the the conflict of interest uh, commissioner the ability, the the privilege, to look into and to consult with each member of parliament, each elected official's affairs, uh, to uh, help them and guide them in how we we conduct our affairs in the most ethical, the most transparent manner. And so, uh, you know, as, as Mr. Barrett had written to the ethics commissioner on this specific issue, it would be really nice to see, um, because this matter is now before the committee, what the actual response was. I would love for Mr. Barrett to share with the whole committee uh, what the ethics commissioner responded back mm -hmm. uh, to him on these questions that we are all deliberating right now on this emergency meeting on this 106.4. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping that Mr. Barrett, uh, on his own accord, uh, would be able to, to share uh, and just forward, uh, whether through the clerk or, or to all of our committee members, what the exact response was. It really, I think, calls into question how we conduct ourselves as members of parliament and the importance of the transparency with which we we operate and the importance of making sure that there is trust in in democratic institutions i mean you know like over over these past couple of days i've uh, i've kind of delved into this uh this question of whether you know like what's the difference between taking a vacation with a family friend um having consulted with the ethics commissioner, letting them know that you were about to do this and then paying back uh, the, the, the flights for it versus, uh, you know, going on a, uh, a trip with a Hungarian think tank to, to the United Kingdom and having thousands of dollars worth of, um, of fine foods. What is that? Uh, where is that line? I mean, how, how, do we, how do we really understand and appreciate 
um, what our role is as members of parliament, what is the role of the Conflict of Interest Act. And I, I think that this is, you know, whether it was, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 important or not to, to to members of the opposition, I think this is an important question for us to to really expand and to understand uh, the, the nature of the study here um, and to to understand and appreciate that this is not just about one person. This is about an institution. It is about how we conduct ourselves. How do we ensure that, uh, that transparency and, and the obligation to Canadians uh, exists in how we operate as members of parliament, being in, uh, in, in a place of privilege where we have the, the opportunity uh, to to make policy, to, to advocate on certain issues, um, and, and what influences those issues. I mean, I, you know, I, I just wonder if a Hungarian think tank would like to influence uh, how we operate here uh, in Parliament and whether a stake would, uh, would uh, really impl- uh, you know, implicate or, or influence uh, what, uh, what the Conservatives would want to advocate for or not. But I think that perhaps this matter really uh, requires uh, a deep understanding as to how the Conflict of Interest Act really operates uh, within within our parliament and how we can ensure that transparency exists and that we continue to maintain um, trust in our democratic institutions uh, in in how we conduct ourselves as members of parliament, um, and I, I as I as I continue to opine on this, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, again say I know that Mr. Brock had referred to uh, the the House leader and the the new House leader. I just want to wish uh, the former House leader um, Karina Gold a, a very blessed uh, maternity leave as she goes on to to have a baby and. Uh, and and just really reconcile with with her own family as uh, as Mr. and uh, Minister McKinnon goes on to take on her role in an acting uh, capacity uh, as she builds her family. Uh, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Khalid. We're going to next go to Ms. Damoff on the motion. Ms. Damoff, you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Chair and uh, colleagues. It's nice to see you. Wishing you all the best for for the new year. Um, so I I want to start just um, when Mr. Barrett began his um, introduction to his motion, he talked about affordability. And, you know, that's a concern that Canadians have. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And that's why, as a government, we have brought in um, reduced child care fees. And if you think that that isn't helping families, I know in my own family, the, the, the reduction of fees by half here in Ontario has made a huge difference, not, not just for my family, but for families all across the country. In fact, yesterday I was at the YWCA in Hamilton talking to, uh, seeing their child care centre, but also talking to the staff about people who've been living in poverty who are now able to access childcare. Um, When it comes to housing, uh, you know, the opposition always neglects to mention that the leader of the opposition has lived in government subsidized housing and then goes out and talks about how we're not doing anything. Well, Monday I was in Burlington, Ontario to announce $21 million for uh, the city of Burlington to accelerate housing in that city. Last month, we announced $55 million in my riding for apartments. It's low interest loans for loans for a developer to be able to build rental units in Oakville. So affordability is an issue and we acknowledge that. And that's why we are, we're working towards that. One of the, uh, one of the things that um, Mr. Barrett talked about and some, and Mr. Brock as well was, you know, about the, the conflict of interest commissioner and, uh, you know, I, Mr. Barrett said that in his response, um, in his response, that the commissioner said that they wouldn't be releasing any documents. Well, rightly so. As a member of parliament, all members of parliament, um, we have the expectation that when we speak to the um, 
ethics commissioner, that that information will be held confidential. Um, there's an expectation that um, when we have those conversations, when we lay out something that we want an opinion on, um, that that's not going to be made public. In fact, if if that was to change and those documents were to be made public, um, quite frankly, no one would consult with the commissioner because there would be a fear that um, privileged and private and um, other information could be made public in the future. So that's a fundamental aspect of that office. Uh, in fact, as, as a parliamentary secretary and as all, I have to file annually uh, report with the ethics commissioner. I, uh, there's no way that it would be appropriate for those kind of documents to be made public, nor would it be appropriate any time that any MP or the prime minister consults with that office, that though that, Though those conversations should be public. There's an expectation that they'll be that they'll be private. So I think that's critically important for us to um, to remember. And the prime minister did communicate with the office before his his um, trip this Christmas, and rightly so. The the office has said that they can't share it. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to leave it there for now. I know that others want to speak to this motion, um, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Damoff. Uh, la prochaine. Uh... The next speaker is Mr. Gord. Mr. Gord, you have the floor. You may begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. Hello to all my colleagues from the House of Commons today. As a co-signatory of this letter on the parliamentary uh, inquiry into the Prime Minister's trips, I was surprised to her here before the holidays that, uh, after the holidays rather, that the Prime Minister had been staying in a... One moment, please. Well, Doug. Thank you. I I'm not getting the translation despite okay. having... On, uh, on, we can have that looked into um, and corrected uh, before we proceed. Thank you. Monsieur Gold, ask you. Mr. Gord, could you please say a few words in French so that the interpreters can interpret into English? All right, I'll begin again especially with regard to the most important th part, the concerns that I've heard in the media during the holidays. Mr. Aldeg, I... Uh, I'm not sure you said you were on English, but can you just double check that for us, please? Je m'excuse, uh, yeah, Mr. I, I, I apologize. And, um, I, I'm not hearing the uh, interpretation. Um, there was something very brief in the background. It's like um, it's picking up from another microphone, but uh, um, it is the floor that I'm hearing despite being on uh, English here. Our, uh, our indication is in the room that the interpretation is working. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is on your end, but what we can do is uh, maybe get a technician to give uh, Mr. Yeah, if they'd like to give me a call, um, yeah. I'll just uh, go back on mute and we'll sort it out. Uh, just, it's an important conversation. I want to make sure that I'm fully following it. And uh, my French is a uh, work in progress, and okay. I just uh, okay. want to make sure that we're, uh, we're plugged in. Yeah, and I want, to, I want to make sure you're following it as well, Mr. Aldeg. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, 